I'll go ahead and get started. Um, you know, like I said, we've got uh, two or three, I think, more sessions left. Um, next week, I have it slated for us to look at skipping tests and test helpers. But if we don't get to the 3E article today, then we'll do that next week. Um, I am fairly busy next week. So if someone else can take that, that would be very helpful. And I will bug people in the um, channel if you're not available to do that, Arthur. Um, all right. And so, yeah, today I'm going through, I'm hoping to go through uh, the reporters help articles um, or help, you know, the reference articles, the running tests in parallel article slash vignette, and then the test that 3E vignette to talk about what did they change in, in 3E, why did they make an addition, all that stuff. Um, and we'll see what we actually get through. I, I have uh, some actual like code demo to, to show these because the help articles don't really say much of anything for these. So um, we'll see how it goes. All right, so we're down here in the, uh, not test helpers, reporters section of the docs. You can see there's this list. And coming soon, the very first thing is going to be the article that actually explains what reporters are because that didn't make it into the list, but I submitted a PR because some of the things reference it. And I was like, wait, what? Um, so that's this managed test reporting article. This is reporter.r uh, is where it's defined. Um, so they, the general idea here is that they have all these reporters. I did not know that these existed. Um, by default, there are, it depends on whether you're testing an entire package or a file or a directory, but the general general idea is they showed these like summary reporters, um, but there are a whole bunch of them. And the idea for a lot of it is to help you like hook into um, formal testing uh, harnesses, which I'll talk about as we get to them, but it's, it's really interesting. Um, Yanni CD has a package um, cover page that is, it, it generates a report in within your GitHub repo about your test coverage so that you can have it like included in uh, the files for the repo and it like helps you see what has changed and things like that. Um, and I have been working with some packages that he wrote and so I've been seeing that. Um, and I think some of his code might be, it might be possible to simplify it by hooking it into this reporter stuff. So um, it's really interesting, I think. So with, uh, without further ado, we will dig into these different reporters. Um, actually, and actually before I dig into them, I am going to flip over to our studio. Um, I have, there's this test that example uh, file. And so uh, we're gonna be looking at that with various reporters to see how things work. Um, if we just say test file and point it at that path, then it does this default reporter, which we will see is actually, um, I think it's, yeah, it is check. Um, and to tell test that which reporter to use, there's this reporter argument. Um, capital, I, I did most, most of them as the single capital word, which is just like the first word of blank reporter. Um, you can also use lowercase or you can give it the actual um, object, the check reporter object. Uh, it wasn't real clear from the help, like how to refer to these things. So I had to experiment a little bit uh, to get to that. So I just wanted to go over that. Um, so yeah, the, the first one is this check reporter. Um, it uh, shows something, it's a, I don't know, again, the help on these is not very helpful. Um, it was more helpful to dig into them, but it says how the R command check uh, displays only the last 13 lines of the testing results. And so this report is designed to ensure that you see something useful there. Um, it's designed to show full information if you have done package tests or if you, basically if you've used test that, you have seen this reporter 
or a variant of it. Um, it shows you like just the full results actually at the top and bottom. Um, did you have any failures? Did you have any warnings, any skips, any passes? Um, and then information about, or you know, details about those. And you can um, like click those to load the files, uh, all of that kind of thing. It's really helpful. All right. The next one that we're going to look at um, is debug. Um, I was a little like uh, two of my book clubs kind of collide here because we went through some debugging stuff in the um, what they forgot to teach you about our uh, book club last week or the last couple of weeks. And so this really closely aligns with that. And just to go into this, when what happens with this one is when you hit an uh, when you hit something, when you hit a, a error or a um, warning, I think it's only an error, but it's um, the skip is throwing a certain kind of error. It goes into the R debugger, and so you can um, enter a frame. So I can oops, let's go to the right window. Um, I can see where it's called from, and I can dig in. I can do uh like um I mean there are no objects defined but if there were objects defined here I could see what their state is things like that so um, this is effectively kind of a, a different name well is it kind of at least an effect John uh kind of like the was a browser or browse command yes so okay. it's it's sending you into what you would see if you um set checkpoints in the code or if you use the uh the browse command, or if you used debug on the function, um, or uh, the function that's actually debug once that you can wrap a function in, they'll say it'll only debug it the next time, but it looks like that. And uh, I think it was Charlotte Garfield uh, pointed out that it looks like debugance. And so now <laughs> I think of it as debugance. Anyway, um, oops, uh, not you. Never remember the commands, but whatever. I'm exiting that. So yeah, it, it I could see that being useful while you are actively um, developing, so that any test that fails, it doesn't just fail. It like shows you where it fails, and you can dig into the code and see why that happened. Um, that I don't know. That might be interesting to play with. Uh, yes. Um, so fail, yeah, just like kind of fails. Um, so if we look at this, it'll throw, or it doesn't, doesn't do anything on this particular one because there aren't any errors. Um, but it, uh, oh, and sorry, yeah, that was to go back. I was saying it does it on an error, but no, what it does on the debug is like it steps through the code. So it lets you walk through. You don't have to hit an error for it. It just like is showing you the steps of the processing versus fail will actually stop anytime you hit an error. It doesn't continue through the tests. Um, I don't know if they, I guess, do they have a, um, no, F2, F, I wanted F1. Uh, I don't know if they have a built-in um, failure. Uh, let's see. Let's just try uh, fail. Mm, nope. Um, okay. Um, so if we go to failure, uh, it just says error failures detected. So not super useful versus if we did the normal check. Um, it tells us where things failed and it lays them out. I think part of the idea of this one, and like they said, it's um, it just throws an error if anything failed. Um, I could imagine maybe using this on um, CI because usually I just want it to fail quickly and then I'll dig in and see uh, myself where the errors are. I don't know. I could see maybe doing it for something like that. They have it there in case you want to do it. So, 
Um, actually, I should have um, just doubled these out because seeing the fill version of everything is kind of helpful. So if we you know, see that, we can see what happens. I'll do that as we go. All right, so that's that's the fail. Um, JUnit, so this is the first example of uh, JUnit is a unit testing um, system. So uh, this is the, I, I guess it's the Jenkins uh, continuous integration system. It's, it's to have uh, automated unit testing. Um, I have, I've never worked with any of these directly, but I've worked at places that work with these. And so the idea is that it gives this formal system, formal output that can be uh, read in by a, a dashboard basically that knows how to deal with these. Um, and if I do that on path two, what happens? Yeah, so it gives us this failure tag and gives us information about how it failed. Um, and you can see like, it's got a type, it's failure message is what it actually prints as the message. Um, yeah, so that's the whole thing. It gives you the time that it took, uh, gives the name of the test. And so I could see how this would be useful in a you know formal environment uh, where you know, it's especially if you're using R code mixed with other code um, where you're working with software developers. Um, this sort of system could be useful. Um, and yeah, there's the formal uh, definition of all that stuff in the link in the help. Uh, so the next one is this list reporter and um, we'll look at it, but then we're gonna talk about it again in a minute after we test some other things. So if you just run it, uh, it doesn't, seem to do anything. And so I was like, okay, but if I assign it to something, it creates this object. And so when you print that object, it gives some, uh, you know, a fairly nice view. And then the object itself is this list of like the stuff that happened in the test. Um, and I don't want to go through all the details there, but you can see like the first object, it's a, an object for each test. And so, you know, we can see what file was the test in, what what was the name of the test, what was the result, um, and then we for the second test we can see okay it was in that same file but it was a different name, uh, and it had a different result. Um, so yeah, I can see this is what I was saying that this kind of thing I don't know if Yanni used this already but in his report that he builds. Um, he builds a uh, markdown report and I could see using pieces of this in that report. Um, I'm trying to think that's, yeah, yeah there's all results. Um, uh, and, and gives you things like time, uh, file name, that sort of thing. And so I suspect that this is used behind the scenes for every, you know, like in the programming of every reporter because it's, all the information that the reporters use to decide what to do. All right, the next one is uh, location. So it shows you like where things happened. So it says, okay, we're starting a test. One plus one is two. And in that, you know, on this line of this file, there was success. On this line of this of the file, there was a skip. And there was a warning of success. Um, it feels like this is almost another one of those unit testing frameworks. I could see something being built to kind of work with that. It also makes like a pretty log, I guess, if you just wanted to have these showing up in some sort of log. Um, I don't know if this, like I suspect most or all of these were built for a specific use case. Um, I don't, I, I would think like this one's pretty good for logs. I, I don't know what else you would want to use that for. Uh, next up, we had minimal. Um, this one is just like a dot or, or a character is each test. A dot is um, success. S is skip. W is warning. 
and I think E or maybe X would have been error. And actually, let's see if we go to uh, path two. Yeah, F for failure. So um, let's see. That's it. Um, this is not that. That's there. Uh, absolute minimum amount of information. <laughs> so um, it doesn't tell you where the errors were or what the errors were. It's just a very short string of what the what happened. So next up, we had multi, and this one I was like, um, what? Like, how do you how do you use it? It doesn't have any arguments. It doesn't like didn't make any sense. And so I actually had to go into the code to figure out it's like okay reporter equals multi it runs but um it doesn't make any sense to just run it with reporter equals multi but what you do is you give it a character vector of different tests so here i'm doing minimal and j unit so it's got the minimal output and then the j unit output um i had to poke around a little to kind of figure out okay it has to be a character vector it can't be a list and it can't be a list of the reporters i thought maybe that would work but no um so it's fine so, you know you, so you it's can, not even invoked directly it's just you end up so it's not a function really unless it's like a yeah so a, somehow like a like a, like a none of the, what do you call none it? Like of the, these the, are, the c the c method for for this yeah, thing you know yeah they're all um they're all R6 objects, really. Um, and so if we look at, like, I never did do that, but if I pr print this check reporter, um, it's a uh, reporter report generator. Um, I didn't want to go into a whole lot of details about how they work, but they're, you know, they're complex R6 objects. And then multi isn't even that, like, I mean, technically it is, I guess it's, uh, it is an R6 object but you never invoke it directly. It gets invoked by test that when you give a character vector of reporters. All right, so, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I usage, could... usage examples would have been really nice for that one. <laughs> yes, for sure. I had to go read some code. I'll probably um, submit a PR on that because these, like all of these, the help really isn't that useful. I had to really dive in uh, to get it to a useful state, partly because writing help for R6 objects is um, a little bit difficult. And then uh, partly because I don't think they use these very much um, yeah. other than the default ones. Um, but I, I don't know, like especially uh, JUnit or, or that idea, the idea of building into unit test frameworks, um, that has a lot of potential. Um, cause there are the, then you don't have to rely on just tests that those unit test frameworks build pretty reports. And so I could see that being useful to set up with, uh, CI for example. So I might have to play with that a little bit. Um, next up was progress, which is, um, th that's the basic one that if you're doing uh, package tests, it will show this and, and like it runs as it runs. It shows you what is happening, um, gives you the final results. But I uh, intentionally, like I tried to make it fit, but then I was like, well, no, because then there's compact progress, which we can see is basically the same thing, but it's a little bit shorter and it fits into my window with the zoom in the at the setting I have. Um, let's see, were there any other notes? Um, yeah, it's designed for interactive use. Uh, it shows things as they happen. Uh, and uh, I don't have it in my runs of parallel progress reporter because um, I didn't want to deal with setting up the parallel tests. Um, but the idea is uh, it has to be different because if they're running in parallel, like that interactive uh, report would get all borked if you're not if you don't have something special happening there. So that's the parallel progress reporter. And then compact just minimizes the progress reporter. And compact is the default when you do test files. So if we went back up to, or if we just do like test file path, it's the same as compact progress reporter. And it, you know, you could see that it ran or it printed things as it ran instead of just doing um, 
the report at the very end. Um, I can't remember, but let's see. So yeah, our studio, um, I don't like, I think this is used inside of some of the reporters. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know why it's called our studio. Like all these other ones also work in our studio. So I'm not sure uh, what that one's about. There's very minimal help here, but it is, it's a nice kind of dense, um, it gives enough information, but um, only the failure or, or not the failure, but the skips and the warnings and the failures. All right, uh, so the next one was, so there's this silent, um, doesn't do anything or it doesn't appear to do anything. It's like, okay, uh, but the list one also didn't appear to do anything. So if I assign that, uh, okay, yeah, it looks exactly like the list reporter. And that made me go, wait a minute. And so if you assign any of them, uh, they're all the list reporter. Like they're, they, so I don't know, like the list reporter is built into, I think every single test, every single report rather. Um, I just thought that was interesting that they really, they're all doing that same thing. Um, the So the stop reporter, that one didn't, this is another one where I think we need path two for it to be useful because yeah, once it hits an error, it will stop. Um, and I guess to really get the, um, see the difference, uh, the only real difference that you can see here is this line is missing in the step stop reporter because it never got to this. It doesn't give you a summary at the end, it just stops. Um, if we had had one that had multiple failures, you can see, or, or a pass after that or whatever, but, um, but it just, uh, stops once it hits a failure. Um, can't remember if they had any other info. Um, right, so this is the one that's built for if you're just running a single expectation. Um, it stops when when there's an error. Um, just for quick and dirty tests. Um, okay. Um, so summary reporter is uh, like the minimum. And then it also gives more details on skips and warnings and errors. So um, so it can use the max reports field. I don't know how to set that actually. Is that? Okay, so if I do some next reports, yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to use that field. So it says I can use that field. Um, I'll have to dig into that more to see, like, uh, uh, is it, so there's summary reporter. Right, the object. Um, see, I was trying to do this where I actually like use the object. I don't think that, oh, that did work. Well, kind of worked. Doesn't seem to be making any difference, but um, doesn't fail. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. <laughs> um, does that do anything? I don't think so. Um, oh, right. Oh, so, okay. So that max reports is failures. So that is, um, that made a difference. Um, so yeah, okay, that is how you use it. So technically there's a third way to call these and that's to actually invoke the um, R6 object by creating a new oops, a new instance of it. And then you can send that new instance um, arguments. 
I'm trying to remember. This might also be the same thing. Let's see. Nope. You have to do new. Um. Yeah. So that's that's that one. That's kind of interesting. Uh, tap is the test anything protocol. This is another one of these test harnesses. So if we call it, it gives a structured output that something, a certain type of um, harness is expecting. Um, simple text-based interface. Uh, and yeah, you can go to this testanything.org to see details about how that works. Uh, Team City is another um, format. So Team City messages uh, are a mes message format, and you can see like it's sending these or it's emitting these messages that are supposed to go into this framework. I'm guessing you could use this to like hook it into a Slack bot or things like that, because um, there's probably already a Team City uh, Slack integration. And so you could hook it up that way. Um, actually, probably true for a lot of these formal or, or like JUnit or TAP or Team City. You can probably hook into Slack. John, do you have any sense of like how prevalent these are? Right? I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of curious, like, like as to why they selected, you know, particular ones. Like, I, I guess I'm sort of familiar with the the Team City one because you know, okay. uh, some like a team near mine uh, does does this for kind of a C sharp <laughs> application they're developing, and uh, but uh, I, I don't know how prevalent it is within within the R universe. I I had never so. I have never heard of any R code hooking into a unit testing framework um, other than just, you know, uh, get, GitHub Actions <laughs> okay. kind of or stuff. Yeah. yeah. But not, uh, I hadn't heard of the, I didn't know these existed for uh, test that until this club. JUnit, I have heard of. Um, I hadn't heard of TAP. I don't think I had heard of Team City. Um, so it's kind of funny that, you know, you've heard of Team City and I've heard of JUnit. So that indicates some level of uh, uh, common uh, commonality, but um, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's really interesting that these exist. Um, like the point of uh, probably JUnit or Team City, I would guess could hook into Slack pretty easily. And so that could be something that might be useful. Um, and I like they all have dashboards. So I can imagine that being useful kind of for the problem that Yanni was trying to solve of um, making a nice, not just failing uh, with GitHub Actions, but give a report via GitHub Actions. Um, I don't know. I, I had no idea that these reporters existed. I don't think they get a ton of attention, but they must be used. Like, why else do they exist? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of wonder. Like, you know, like number number one is like, could you, would it be relatively easy for someone to kind of take these? I don't know if I can call it this way. Like, testing primitives and 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 sort of like generate generate outputs for another arbitrary framework. And then I, I guess the that's kind of like one a set of questions I have in my mind. And the second, which is maybe potentially orthogonal to that is if there's any kind of tie-in between test that and, I'm not sure if you're familiar with point blank. I mean, point blank is more oriented towards, I guess, data quality issues, uh, but it, you know, it has this, this whole reporter framework. So, so in a sense, it's sort of like a CI for data, if I could put it that way. Um, right. And, but it has some nice elements to it that seem a little potentially more general. I don't know if there are any tie-ins between the two packages. Uh, anyway, just a couple, couple disparate thoughts I'll put out there. I mean, not in search of any immediate question, but just kind of things that bubble to mind. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know um, is where I sit with that. There's also, so I didn't dive into it, but in uh, the first help, the managed test reporting. Um, 
And they talked a little bit Is this indexed, by the way, on, on the page? I was, so, I was trying to look for it. I, I, yeah. I just saw the URL on your browser. and uh, It is yeah. not. And so okay. I'll, if you look at, um, go to uh, the GitHub repo for test that, we can see that, go to closed pull requests. Um, there. <laughs> Because of this, because of this uh, uh, book club, I submitted a fix. Because um, what they do is uh, the this block is set up using ends with reporter, and reporter doesn't end with reporter, uh, evidently. And so I had to explicitly add reporter above the ends with reporter section. And so the next time they build uh, the index it will have reporter up there at the top. Got it. Because, um, yeah, without that article, these are very confusing, <laughs> I think. Um, it's like, what are they? Because the help articles themselves assume you already know what a reporter is. Yep. And so, um, yeah. Also, I don't know that the help articles could be any better because it sort of feels, I, I don't know, it seems like it'd be difficult to to, to document these absent a vignette. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, well, so like, um, having this example was pretty necessary to make any sense, uh, like, you know, to set up a way to view these. And so it would be nice to, to have, uh, I mean, they have an example of, for each of the reporters. Um, yeah. if you can have the default example, it seems like it should be possible to have an example for every one of them. Um, maybe not for the ones that actually throw errors, but the ones that um, don't throw errors, it'd be nice. So I, I, I'll probably do another round on these and go through and say, hey, you know, can we make these help articles actually show something so I don't, don't have to fumble around? Like just to, uh, figuring out how to call a reporter was work. Um, and I guess I can add that you can also do that. Um, and so, yeah, ma making that clear would be nice, especially especially in the one that had the argument. Um, whichever one this was, it has the block. Stop reporter, I think. No, it was uh, this, Max Reports. Um, I couldn't figure out how to give it that argument, you know? <laughs> so it's very confusing. Um, and so having that detail would be nice. Uh, okay, and then the the last article on these is um, there's this default reporter also doesn't show up in the index right now, um, and I didn't submit a fix to show this, but it really should that um, it depends on the context, uh, but it it figures out you know am I running this in test file? Is it running in test um, package? Uh, is it and or test path and each of those gives you different um reporters um or if you're just running a single um check a single uh uh expect expectation it'll um use check reporter um and then also in our cmd check and they have these uh options that you can set to change uh, what reporter is used, that would be, a, so I guess that, you know, in addition to this reporter equals, you could set an option to explicitly um, change what is used. Uh, and that's, yeah, if I just run, I think, oops, if I run default reporter, yeah, it'll tell me progress because that is kind of the fall through default, the, the base level default. Um, oh, and there are these other uh, functions. So default uh, parallel reporters, parallel progress, default compact is compact progress, uh, and check reporter is check. Um, what was the other thought? I, oh, just I, I could imagine setting a, um, like, I don't know what calls the 
default compact reporter, but you know, you can changing that to the minimal um, reporter, I could see being a thing, things like that. I just don't know where this is actually used. So um, yeah, I think that's everything on the reporters. Any other thoughts or questions? All right, so the, the piece that was related, you know, because there's a uh, default parallel progress or defer, default parallel reporter, it's like, okay, so that must tie into uh, running tests in parallel. The really like basics on this are you can set this thing in the description of a package, I config test that parallel to true. Um, and you have to be using third edition of test that, which we'll talk about hopefully in a minute. Um, and what it does is it'll um, use the get option and CPUs, um, which I think is null by default, yes. Um, or this test that CPUs environment variable, which would also be null. And if not, neither is set, it uses two. <laughs> um, so, you know, step one is if you set this in your CI, you definitely want to, um, or in your, maybe not in your CI, but in whatever, you want to make sure that these are set to use uh, some sort of rules. That's something that I would have to look at for this is, um, I'm not sure the default runner for GitHub, if you have more than one CPU available, I don't know. Um, for the most part, part of kind of the idea of tests is you should write them so they don't take that long. Um, but sometimes that's not really viable. And, you know, some tests might be kind of slow. And so having them run in parallel can be at least hypothetically nice. <laughs> um, it runs the files in parallel. Uh, it does it, uh, it assigns them in alphabetical order. So they say, if you have a slow one, set it up so it runs first. So it's definitely, you know, so the second process can run all the other ones basically. Um, uh, states per percent. Oh, um, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't reset state. And so some, um, depending on which runner you get on, uh, things might go kind of haywire and it's, that's actually a good thing to check for to make sure that your tests are set up to properly set up and tear down. Um, and it it does run, uh, so there are, um, you, know, you can have setup files. And so the setup files will run on each of the runners. Um, so if you have a slow setup process, you probably don't want to do this. Um, your tests can be weird, like they can fail stochastic, yeah, stochastically, meaning that there's some sort of uh, dependency between your test files. So watch out for that. Um, and it, if you have like a case where this could be weird is I'm working with um, packages that are interacting with the Slack API. And in some cases we actually hit the API. Like we, we have a variable that tells the runner whether to actually hit the API or whether to just use some um, mock information. If you're actually hitting the API and you're running that in parallel, uh, different files could be hitting the API and like changing the state. And, you know, even if they change it back at the end, if you're running at the same time, uh, the state could be weird. And so that's something to watch out for. Um, and that's if you're setting stuff up at the beginning of the package and then tearing it down at the end, uh, you would, would be like setting it up twice. Um, and so that could, if it's hitting some outside thing that could break things. Um, yeah, you can change the order. Oh, um, start first. I, I actually hadn't read this part. I skimmed over, I guess. Um, change the order, the start first option. Um, Okay, and so you can, you tell it, uh, so glob is the, uh, like, it, it's the kind of file format 
um instead of reg x it's like you know parallel star means parallel with anything after it but watcher is a specific file named watcher um and so you can tell it which ones to start first that's easier or that seems like a better way to do it than relying on file name like they have up here so that makes sense to me um ignores the test prefix prefix so just the word that's after test um yeah and then the reason that this ties into the reporters is that not all of the reporters work in parallel um and so within the help they go into um these ones don't work so the debug reporter the j unit reporter um because it does timing of each block um which is interesting because j unit like i could imagine you want might want to run it in parallel but okay uh the location reporter because it like screws up the location stuff and stop reporter um it's meant to be interactive and it's supposed to stop things from working so having that work in parallel would be weird um yeah reporters that stop after a certain number of failures have to go to the end of a file if you're running in parallel because um just the way it things work um so uh, yeah and the things that report um uh they actually i think that's saying that backwards things that report as they go instead of all at once can be weird on parallel so you need to make sure that's um making sense uh and then all the messaging can be weird so that's the basic side there i didn't really dig into writing um you know, I didn't read the stuff about writing reporters because I don't have any plans to do that yet, but that is something I, I don't know, I might do as I dig into these. And if so, this would be worth reading to make sure that it makes sense uh, for parallel. Um, and then the parallel updates is related to that. You have to make sure that your updates are working properly if you are writing a, something for parallel. Um, did that at least kind of makes sense. <laughs> I, I would say like the basics yeah, of I think it so. are, yeah, like don't change the reporter. Like I, I think the basic use case would be you can set it um, as long as you're using third edition. By default, it'll use the parallel reporter. And so you don't have to worry about which ones work with it. Um, and then just be careful that your files don't talk to each other. Um, like I said, I can imagine this being useful for uh, well, I was going to say for CI, but actually even more so for local testing. If you want to be testing often, which you know it's a good thing to do, and you have anything that's slow, um, making it less slow is a good thing. So, all right, that's the basics there. And then for the last few minutes, um, there's this vignette about this third edition. Um, this was a, I don't know, weird-ish, like just a new and weird thing that they did uh, a year or two ago, whenever 3E came out. Um, I'm actually a little curious about that. So uh, oh, a year and a half ago, end of 2020. Um, and so like the the very basic, uh, idea is you can use this local edition to temporarily set the edition to a certain number. Something that I got out of this vignette that was uh, pretty useful is if you have a test that um, you wrote for second edition that is failing and you don't have time to deal with like how to update it to third edition, you can just put in that individual test local edition two, and then it will work. Um, or it it will run using the second edition of test that, the older edition. Um, I thought that was really interesting because I could imagine, you know, that gives you a process that you can turn on third edition for a package, but then set local edition two to any for anything that fails and then go through an update to make them pass again. Um, 
so the reason that they did this, um, I think they say that down here. Yeah, at the end of why. Um, the general reason was that they uh, wanted to change a lot of things. Um, so it was almost enough to make a new package, but it had a ton of overlapping code. And so they didn't want to make a new package and have to update two packages with all the same changes. Like if they find a bug, they have to fix it in both places. Um, but then R doesn't um, allow you to, or it allows you to, but it doesn't, it's not common to set like a maximum version. Um, other you know packages that are on CRAN are going to use the newest version of test that. And so if they changed test that significantly, like every package on CRAN would break and CRAN would reject the test that update. And so, and right, rightfully so, you can't break every package. And so they came up with this idea of using, I mean, and obviously not every package, but a lot of packages use test that. Um, so yeah, they have this version or addition rather, that is a separate thing from version um, that you have to explicitly tell uh, CRAN version via, or you tell test that really via the, the description that you want to use this third edition. Um, they talk about how, you know, if there's a test that version four, that will also be edition four. Um, and they'll do those sorts of updates uh, in the future. Um, yeah. Um, if you call use this, use test that and give it a number, it will explicitly update to use third edition. I'm pretty sure I need to check that. Um, use test that edition is null by default, but I think, um, I think now it, uh, defaults to three. Oh it, yeah, it uses the package version. So if if the installed version of test that is old, it'll use, um, it, it yeah. If, if if your installed version is old, it uses the old version. Is basically what happens there. Um, but otherwise, if you have the newest version of test that installed, you don't have to give it that three. It'll use the three. I think if you have if you have a package already, it'll keep it at the version that you have. So unless you explicitly tell it three. Um, and then, yeah, so if you do that uh, upgrade and then run your, you know, run your test before you upgrade and then upgrade and run your test again and see if something now fails that didn't used to fail. Um, but for the most part, free just, it gives better output. It uses Waldo, which is great. It, it gives the, um, the, uh, more details about where errors are. And something that I found by reading this was that, um, or, or two things. In the second edition, if you have expect warning, um, even if you give it uh, regex of what to expect, if you have multiple warnings, it won't tell you about those warnings. It'll say, oh, I saw the warning that you told me to expect. And so it's silent that there are other warnings. Ah, interesting. Yeah. Versus third edition, it tells you, okay, this is the one you were expecting, but there were also these other warnings. Um, so that's a reason to upgrade right there, in my opinion. Um, also messages. Um, <laughs> I love the reasons that I can no longer remember, just that silently ignores all messages. Um, so for third edition, they uh, stopped that, that they make you say expect message. Otherwise it'll tell you, hey, there was a message. Um, and you didn't tell me to expect that. So those two things, I think, are the reasons that it's worth upgrading. Now, the re reasons to avoid upgrading are it deprecated a lot. And so uh, your test will fail if you use these things that are deprecated. So there used to be expect is. They split that up into expect type, expect S3 class, and expect S4 class. Um, there was an old expect that syntax that... Uh, I love it was an overly clever API that I regretted even before the release of test that 1.0.0. So um, don't do that, apparently. Um, <laughs> he's got lots of like uh, 
writing this article definitely amused Hadley because he has a couple of times where he's got these ha-has in here. Uh, um, but expect equivalent is equivalent to expect equal with ignoring uh, attributes. Um, so uh, expect equal, ignore attributes, won't ignore names. You have to explicitly unname. You know, there are lots of little things. Um, and then we're going to talk about the text fi test fixtures uh, coming up soon. That is the preferred way to do things instead of set up and tear down now. Um, and then, yeah, we talked about the expect snapshot um, replaced a bunch of these expect known output type things. And then the uh, last one uh, with mock and local mock are deprecated. It says he says to use mocker and mockery instead, except if we go back over to where we were looking at uh, recently closed pull requests. Um, re enter the mocking game. So test that is bringing back uh, built in mocking um, in the next edition. Interesting. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's still, um, it's not, it's a different way to do it, um, but it's to to kind of bring it front and center. Um, I have not read through the help yet, and but I'm hoping before we end this book club, we'll be able to uh, easily look at the help for that because that is going to be something um, that's kind of a big deal. Very briefly, mocking is uh, where you like um, like change the way that something will behave. Um, I, I, it's easier for me to do with the concrete example that on all the Slack tests we have, we use the um, HTTP test package, which helps with mocking of uh, HTTP requests. And so when we're running it, uh, basically there's a, we, we have a variable or an environment variable that we check. If you are set to like actually test, then it will um, hit the API. If you don't have that environment variable, then it just uses some canned responses from the API that it would get, the API would send um, given uh, the, the calls that you make within the tests. And so um, that lets us uh, uh, like test everything, assuming that the API still works the way that the API worked when we set up the tests. And then there's a way you can record those. But the idea is that you're mocking the API call. So you're, you're putting in a fake thing. Instead of actually making the API call, just um, load this result off of the disk. Uh, that's the general idea with, with mocking. Um, I had just started to learn to do mocking when it got deprecated in test that, and it, it was very annoying. It's actually took me a while to upgrade to test that three because of that. Because another example is if you're hitting a database, it's a good idea to just have a built-in um, response from that database in your tests and assume that the database hasn't changed. Um, I like that's not a safe assumption in a lot of cases, but for the package itself, you don't want to have to constantly test has the database changed. And so um, it's nice to have mocks for that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, so that was a big change. Um, I think that's that's all the stuff in here. Like it's the pretty output. Oh, um, they, the, actually this was a, a useful thing to know that in third edition, there's all this stuff that gets set um automatically of it sets your locale and um, some other options so that the output is always the same um so like if you record something it will record the same on someone else's computer i thought that was really um like i get it but i also think i have some tests that i need to update because um like I'm assuming that some things might change from in, in a couple of different systems where I'm testing it and they actually don't change because it has this local reproducible oh, right. output by, by default. Um, and so you have to actually explicitly set those things, which is, you know, it's fine. I shouldn't assume, 
Um, I need to check. I might not actually do that, but if I do, um, you need you know you just need to explicitly set locale, for example, um, and tell it uh, like you can assume that you're starting with the local or the um, collate equals C you know setting things like that. Um, I need to dig into this local reproducible output and see if it's anything that matters. So it you know it's got uh, Unicode false, it's RStudio false, which is interesting. Um, all these different things. And so you need to make sure that you are explicitly setting these things. Um, you know, don't use local reproducible result for a test that met, that cares about those things. And they've got details in this help article about like what that does and how to deal with it. Um, yeah, so oops, that's that. That's third edition. We, you know, we've seen this a few times. The, the main thing is the, or the, the main reason to do it is the Waldo. Um, the comparisons are much easier to follow. I used to, like, in addition to kind of faking snapshot testing, you know, you used to have to do like a column by column comparison if you're looking at data frames so that you could see where the difference was. Because if you just do the entire object, it was like, okay, this object has changed. But it was hard to find where did it change um, versus with Waldo and with snapshots. It's really easy to see what what changed. Um, so that's really useful. Uh, yeah, so that's that's third edition. And that is the hour. And so next week we have a meeting. Um, we'll talk about or I'll, I'll, I'll go poke people to try and get someone to cover that. Um, and then two weeks off and then the last little bits. Um, I've got custom expectations all alone on in April, but we'll probably go like kind of back and and fill in anything that has changed while we've been go through going through the package. Uh, and then after that, we'll be doing another package. Sounds okay. good. John, I'll see if I can grab the skipping test. so I'll, I'll kind of look at my my calendar uh, and uh, see if I can take that on. Okay, great. Uh, this is good I stuff. This is uh, really kind of encouraging me to up my up or at least change my testing game. I, I kind <laughs> of, it's one of those things like I, I feel like it, sadly I've done infrequently enough. Like I did seriously for one package, uh, but I've not retouched that since. And <laughs> I feel like I need to revisit. I need to revisit that. I've just never been able to convince myself. I think now there's kind of enthusiasm around it, hopefully. So I can I can go back and, and do that. Yeah, uh, I have. Like I'm usually pretty adamant about testing, but I have my shiny Slack package, which combines shiny testing and API testing. And so that one has no tests right now. And this one, this is getting me to where I feel like, okay, maybe I'm ready to do all the high level testing in one package because <laughs> it's all mocks, like yep. tons of mocks. Um, but all right, cool. I will uh, see you on Slack. All right. Thanks so much, John. Yeah. All right. Bye -bye. You're welcome. Bye.